James chapter 5. We'll, we'll read the whole chapter. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver have become worthless. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This treasure you have accumulated will stand as evidence against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The wages you have held back cry out against you. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the innocent people who do not resist you. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and and in, in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job? a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my dear brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. Are there any of you suffering hardship? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. And then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. My dear brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. May God bless this word into our lives, that by the very fact that we have read it and heard it, we will not be the same. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we continue in our series from the book of James. We gave a title to this series, Under Pressure. James starts this chapter off a little little tough. Um, It's not the first time in this series he has stepped on our toes. So can we give him permission again this morning to do the same? Is that all right for him to step on our toes a little? He starts off by saying this, Look here, you rich people, weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Boy, that's real encouragement to get rich, isn't it? Yeah, let's all go out and get rich so that we can experience terrible troubles that lie ahead. God has a warning to those who are financially rich. But I want you to understand that God is not against financial wealth. He's not against financial wealth. As a matter of fact, God owns the whole world. Everything in it belongs to him. Whether you have little in your eyes or whether you think you have a lot, the fact is that God owns it all. God's not against wealth. However, he is aware how wealth can destroy a person if they don't handle their wealth 
in a godly manner. James says terrible troubles await those who cave to the pressure to accumulate wealth for their own selfish desires, for their own selfishness. You see, James is not uh, speaking about wealth itself. In other words, condemning wealth. He's talking about the danger that wealth brings to those who do not handle it in a godly manner. He says your wealth is rotting away. The King James says it this way, your riches are corrupted. Your riches are corrupted. <clears throat> the implication here is that people were storing up an excess of riches for themselves rather than providing for their needs and then blessing others. Do you know that the promise to Abraham is, hasn't changed? It's the same for us. God says to Abraham, and he says to you and me, I want to bless you so that you will be a blessing. There's nowhere in the scripture that says God wants to bless you so that you can store it up and hoard it for yourself. If you can find that verse, let me know. But you know, a lot of what I hear, even not just out in the world, what I, a lot of what I hear in the kingdom of God, kind of encourages that mentality among even believers. You know, God wants to bless you. God wants to give you. God wants to give, give, give. And there's never the second part of why God wants to give. God wants to give so that we are givers. Do you know that? God wants you and I to be channels of his blessing. And it doesn't matter whether you have, in the eyes of the world, little or a lot. I have found I have found that the most faithful givers to God's kingdom are those who don't have a lot. The most faithful givers. You see, sometimes the more we accumulate, the less we begin to offer up to God. Not always. Not always. It's not a judgment on anybody. It's just kind of the fact. And because there's a, there's a temptation, and well, James is going to kind of warn us about this temptation. You see, the, it's the self-focus. This self-focus is what makes our riches corrupted. The, the riches are corrupted because of whose hands they're in. And so if our hearts are corrupted with selfishness and all these you know, self-desires that we're going to hoard up for ourselves, that corrupts the riches that God wants to pour into our lives. Have you ever seen this show, Hoarders? I've seen about two of those shows. And the one I remember <laughs> was this guy, his whole house was full of trash bags, and some of them weren't even in trash bags, full of drink cans. And, I mean, he had bags upon bags in his whole house. Just, I mean, in it, the, whole, the whole house was just kind of trashy. And, and he had, he was storing up these cans in hopes that he would have at least one valuable can that would be the ticket for his retirement. You know, that was, that he would have that one can that everybody else wanted and he would make you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so in order to find the one can, he had to fill his whole house full of cans. And so he was hoarding. And they brought, you know, psychologists in, try and work with him, you know, and a lady who would come in and, and try to work with him. And, and I tell you what, it, Sherry's not here this morning, but I know I speak the very words out of her mouth. <clears throat> if they had a job opening for somebody to go in and clean up that mess, that is her dream job. She would love to go in there and just grab a hold of stuff and just throw it all out and get everything nice and tidy and organized. And, you know, isn't it odd that we have a reality show based on hoarding? I think that's sad. That's really what James is writing about. He's writing about the sin of hoarding. <clears throat> It's not sinful to have things in your life. The sin is when those things begin to control your life. It's 
when they control you. <clears throat> you know, I am thankful that God has blessed men and women in the kingdom of God who can acquire lots of resources. And those men and women who have a, have a heart to acquire the resources so that they can be a blessing, so they can give it away. Not necessarily to go and build bigger and better and whatever, but so that they can sow into the kingdom of God. What if every believer began to think entrepreneurially to acquire resources to sow into the kingdom of God, into missions? It's been often said that just the resources that Christians have in excess in America, if those resources were all compiled together, we could supply every missionary to reach every people group to fulfill the Great Commission. Wow. Wow, that's, that's powerful, isn't it? James goes on to say, he says, well, you know, listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. As the wages you held back cry out against you, the cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's army. He goes on to say, you know, you have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. Right there is why James is putting this in this letter. Is because when our focus becomes on how we can live for ourselves and our own selfish desires, that's what corrupts what God gives us. When I was studying for the message today, there was another story in the Bible that kind of came immediately to my mind when I was reading these verses. When I read these verses that the cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's army. Does that remind you of anything else in the Bible? It reminded me of when Israel, the Israelites, were in Egypt. And you know, when Israel went to Egypt, they went there as descendants of Joseph. Joseph went to Egypt. Do you remember that? And he became very popular in Egypt. And he was blessed, and, and God just poured out a blessing upon this man. And he went back and got his family and brought them into Egypt. And so they came to Egypt to be blessed and to be a part of this great inheritance that God had given to Joseph. And they began to populate, you know, they began to expand and generation upon generation, they began to populate Egypt. And Pharaoh became threatened that they were going to take what was his. And so guess what plan he came up with? Let's enslave them. Let's make their work hard. Let's give little to them to discourage them. But while we're doing it, let's do it in a way that we will benefit. That Pharaoh and his kingdom will benefit from the slavery, from, you know, the hardships of those he was threatened by. And it says that the cries of the Israelites went up to the ears of God. And when God heard the cries of the Israelites, what did he do? You remember? He found a guy out in the desert who was 80 years old, spoke to him through a burning bush and said, Moses, I've been preparing you for 40 years. It's time to go to Egypt to get my people. And I thought, wow, that same spirit is still what was there in the first century church. And do you think it might be still a part of what we deal with today? That same spirit? I believe it is. I believe this letter is as much for us today as it was for James and the believers in the first century church. You see, let me bring some application to this. When you are under this pressure to acquire more and hoard everything, the way you relate to people and treat people in this world will be driven by this sinful desire. It'll, it'll, be driv it'll drive how you treat people around you. 
For example, when you go to a restaurant and the check comes, do you tip according to how little you think you can get by with so that you can have more when you leave the restaurant? What would happen if you made that decision based on how you could bless your server even if he or she didn't get everything right? You know, I know a lot of people, they go to a restaurant, and I mean, they have like super duper, you know, satellite radar up. And the, they're waiting for the first mistake by the server so that they can justify not leaving a tip. It's like, well, I mean, did, didn't bring my water when I asked for, you know, didn't, my steak wasn't cooked the way I wanted it. There was a survey done. I wish I would have looked it up to give you the, the, uh, the resource of where it, was, where it was done. But I remember this several years ago. A survey was done among restaurants, among servers. And you know that the survey found that the least, that, that the time of the week where servers receive the least amount of tips, do you want to guess when it is? It's Sunday around 1 o'clock. We even had a server, a local server, tell Sherry and I one time, we were out to dinner, and I was, we were having this conversation, and I said, and she said, well, yeah. She said, it's true. And I thought, how, how could that be? I mean, is that something for us to be proud of as believers? I mean, it actually should be the very opposite. The most <clears throat> generous time for our servers should be Sunday at 1 o'clock. We should be pouring out blessing upon them. But this spirit, when it gets in us, when we're so consumed in what we don't have to give away and what we can hold and we make everybody around us Earn it? You got to earn my blessing. What a wonderful witness that is. Boy, you know, wouldn't you want to just hand them that, you know, $2 tip on a $70 bill and then invite them to church? Hey, you know what? Are you a believer? No, I'm not. Well, you know what? We have a wonderful church. Man, we're just so giving, so friendly. You know, once that waitress or waiter gets back to the desk there and looks at that $2 tip, they could care less when you go to church. They could care less. God wants to pour a blessing out on us as believers. So that we can be a blessing. I'm telling you, the law of the harvest is as true today as it was in the Bible. The law of the harvest is real simple. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Maybe the reason that your water is being forgotten has nothing to do with the waitress or the waiter. It actually has to do with God dealing with your attitude. Maybe God put his foot up and said, nah, don't take that order right now. I'm doing something over here. I'm trying to irritate them to repentance. You know? I'm trying to, I'm trying to block them, you know? Tell them to cook back, back, in, the, back in the kitchen. Hey, uh, cook that one about five minutes longer. I've got somebody out here that I'm kind of dealing with, and I hope this really irritates them to repentance. I mean, this spirit of the age, man, this is, a, this is the spirit. But where this spirit, I think the doorway comes, is when we cave in to this pressure that we somehow have to pile up and hoard up all these things over here for ourselves. That's where the pressure comes. You know, I live in the same world that you live in. And I know that pressure is real. We've got to build it up and protect it and put walls around it. And, you know, and the Bible says, it says it's actually very, 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 very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know,
You know, you could push a camel through the eye of a needle easier than you could bring a rich man into the kingdom. Why? Because they're, they don't, because they're undeserving? No. It's because it has nothing to do with the wealth. It has to do with the heart of the person who owns it. They have become self-sufficient, not dependent on God anymore. You know, you could have $5 million in your bank account, and I pray that all of you would. I pray that every one of you and me, we could have $5 million in our bank account. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Hey, God could do it. Who knows? But what I pray more is that you and I would have the heart to know what to do with it. Why do you think so many people go in, dive into poverty after they win the lottery? They win the lottery and end up in poverty. How in the world does that make any sense? You know, the whole, the whole lottery system is sold on, you know, you can get rich by just paying a couple bucks for a few tickets. And then they dive into poverty and have to go out and squander it all? That's because we're putting our, we're putting, you know, we're putting our faith in the systems of this world and not in God. But we fall under this pressure. Are you getting this? Are you with me? Now, every time you go out to eat, you're going to be wondering if I'm around the corner. <clears throat> I, I, you know, you, you need to just go with the leading of the Holy Spirit on this. You really do. <clears throat> I remember two, maybe three, three Thanksgivings ago. I forgot what was going on in our family. We were celebrating Thanksgiving at another day. I forgot when it was, maybe on a Saturday or something, not on a Thursday. And so Jonathan and Hope and Sherry and I, we were just at home that day wondering, well, you know, I mean, we ain't cooking. I mean, we didn't know what we were going to do. I mean, we were going to have Thanksgiving a few days later. So we ended up at a local restaurant. We, we thought, well, I wonder if there are any restaurants in there. Well, sure enough, there was a local restaurant in Waynesboro that was open that day. So we went there. Well, the longer we sat there and saw our waitress waiting on all these tables, I mean, we began to just feel a compassion for her. It, it then dawned on us, like, she's working on Thanksgiving. How is she going to be with her family? And so <clears throat> after that discussion, the kids said, okay, Dad, sure, we know what you're going to do. And uh, we left her about a, I think it was about a 75% tip in our total bill. We didn't say anything. Wrote a little note on there and just thanked her for serving us that day. You know, we, we had the money to do that. God had blessed us to be able to do that. It didn't hurt didn't put us in bankruptcy. Now, I'm not saying you need to go and do that, but I'm just saying the, the point of me telling you that is that God can even speak to you and lead you to be a blessing by the leading of the Holy Spirit in those situations. He can. And so as Christians, we are to be givers. We're not to be to succumb to this pressure. And then that leads into what James says. Then he goes from that talking about, you know, the kind of the struggle, the, the, the troubles that come with these riches, into then talking about impatience. And I think it's all kind of connected. He says, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who uh, are patiently wait for the rains to fall and, you know, to receive their, to receive their crops, to receive their blessing. And, and, you know, in this microwave world, we, we want things to happen like right now. We want it right now we ain't got patience we don't even have patience to have patience while the technology age has given us so much good it has it also has a, a slippery downside to it it really does because we are so wired and available through texting and email and social media our patience threshold has actually decreased with each other we send someone an email, 
and we assume they are at their phone or their computer and at that very moment, moment and expect an immediate reply <coughs> because certainly no one else could be emailing them. I'm struggling with this. I, I, I'm struggling with how to manage my daily deluge of, of emails that hit my inbox. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say I have 6,500 emails in my inbox right now. I can't, I can't keep up with them. And so sometimes I do exactly what I do in my office. Get stacks of papers. I clean my office. And, and I don't know, there's probably some guys in here kind of clean their office the same way I do. I get a big box. And I just put everything in the box. And I close it up so I don't have to look at it again. And I figure that if it's real important, somebody will call. <laughs> somebody will write again. <laughs> a bill collector will show up. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the best management system. All right? I'm just sharing my heart with you. But it's, it, it's a struggle, and so we grow impatient. I think this technology age has caused us to be impatient with each other because we want things now. Right? We want our blessings now. We want to hold them up over here for ourselves now. And we get impatient with each other because certainly our email is the most important. It should be at the top of the person's list. You know, I mean, it has to be. And, and we're just, we go crazy with each other over these things. And especially after you turn 50, you know, they said, I would lose my mind when I turned 50. And sure enough, they were exactly right. You forget stuff, too. <laughs> I'm finding that more and more. Some of you shaking your head. You're right there with me. Hey, we're in it together. Maybe between all of us, we'll come up with one mind. And so there's this impatience. And then that leads to verse 9 that says, James says, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. And so our impatience leads to grumbling and complaining, and our grumbling and complaining lead to false judgments and assumptions of other people. And so now we're, you know, we're grumbling, and, and you know, and, and some of you, you're already priming your grumbler before Thanksgiving. You're already thinking about the crazy people in your family they are getting ready to show up in a few days. You know? And your temptation is to get your grumbler start churning, all right? You know, old crazy Joe is going to be showing up anytime. And, you know, that crazy aunt of yours, she's going to be there. And, and Lord, we, let's don't even talk about your mother-in-law and your father-in-law, what they bring to the party. And so you're already, you're already churning, man. You're getting your grumbler primed. And you're already starting to complain. You ain't got patience for that. And so I'm going to give you a piece of advice that we do over at the Mayo Farm. We go outside and shoot guns on Thanksgiving Day. Now, we don't take the people that we're grumbling about out there with us. Don't get me wrong. You, you need to go buy you, for $10, you can go over to Kmart and buy you a box of 90 clay. And, uh, and get you some shotgun shells and come on over to the Mayo Farm and you can, we'll have a Sharpie and you can write names on those clays, all right? We'll throw them out there and you can just shoot all day. You got to find a way to deal with your grumbler. But oftentimes the reason we're grumbling is because we've grown impatient. And the reason that we've grown impatient is because we're we're, we're we're no longer seeing life as opportunities to give. And we get frustrated when our life is so consumed in what we can get and store away. And so if we're not getting and storing away, we grow impatient. And when we grow impatient, we get irritated with people. And maybe the reason that God's going to send the crazy people to your Thanksgiving party is because he wants to deal with that in your life. And so now, you're not going to get your water. Your steak's going to be overcooked. And now Crazy Joe's going to show up at your Thanksgiving. And all the while, you're thinking, this has got to be of the devil. And God.
God is the one that's orchestrating all of it because he loves you. He he absolutely adores you and loves you and wants you to be a giver. You know, when we think about thanksgiving, we often think about, I'm thankful for what I have, right? Okay, I'm thankful for, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'd like to give you a different perspective on Thanksgiving. How about being thankful for what you can give? God, I am thankful that you have blessed me with a job, that I receive a paycheck, and I can give, whether it's back to your kingdom, whether it's through my tithes and offerings, or whether it's God, I can bless, you know, so-and-so at the gas station. You know, I had someone recently, uh, once in a while, we do these anonymous kinds of, you know, random acts of kindness. Do you ever do random acts of kindness? Just, God just tugs at your heart. One of the easiest ones to do is uh, when you're going through that drive-thru because you need your meal right now. Instant. I need my drive through meal. I ain't got time for all this. I need my instant meal. Take a deep breath after you order. Inhale. Exhale. Okay. Lord, speak to me now. And God says, look in your rear view mirror. You see, sometimes we're so focused on trying to, you know, get to the next thing, get to the next thing, get to the next thing. We forget to look in the rear view mirror. And, and one time I looked in my rearview mirror over here at this McDonald's, and I saw a lady that I knew. She was a single mom. She had three kids. She lived a tough life. And so after she ordered her meal, and I got up, she was right behind me. I got up to the window. She didn't know it was me, I don't think. And I just paid for her meal. I, I, I don't. You and I, we don't need recognition for that. God in heaven knows. You see, God gave me the resources at that moment to bless her. Isn't that cool? You know, go into restaurants, look around. Sherry and I, we do this a lot. Look around and see who's in that restaurant that God might say, buy their meal today. We love doing that kind of thing. We love it. We love it. How about this year we be thankful that we're givers, not just receivers? What is God calling you to do? Um, there's a lot in this chapter, and, and I'm really considering. I had a whole lot more I wanted to get into, but um, I'll probably come back to this the 1st of January because we're going to start a kind of a Christmas theme next week. And I think I'm going to come back, and we're going to start right here in, in January, the end of this chapter, because I think it's going to really launch us even into some, some things that... Uh, we want to focus on this next year. But well, I just I just felt the Lord this morning and then right now and just right here's where we need to stop. And just focus on our attitude. Attitude of thanksgiving. Shall we bring the team up? And you know, I I just ask you, I mean, have you gotten kind of trapped in this whole idea of hoarding? You know? And, you know, hoarding is not just about tin cans. It could be hoarding your time. It could be hoarding your emotions. You're unwilling to just give your heart away to someone. You're just holding back. You're hoarding. You're hoarding your feelings. I mean, you have a heart of love to give away. But you're hoarding it for yourself. It could be your finances. Yeah, it could be whatever. But what about this morning we ask God to do something different in our lives, to make us thankful that we're givers, not just receivers. Amen? Let's stand together.